Well, shalom from Jerusalem. Happy Hanukkah. And uh, may peace be upon Israel uh, this week, particularly strength and courage for our soldiers. And uh, here we are studying the uh, Parashat Teshuvua and the Haftarah portions um, for the, the weeks, the Torah portions of uh, Vayishlach and uh, Vayashev. And that's in Genesis 20, uh, 32 up until, until 40. So quite a bit to go through, but we also get to hear from the prophets, um, the prophet o, uh, Ovadia, Obadiah, and Zechariah. Um, so two prophets whom we don't always jump to, but uh, but the, the Jewish people read in their rhythm of, uh, of reading and cycle of prayer. So let's pray as we gather in uh, the name of the Lord to um, to study his word and learn and apply it to ourselves. So Father in heaven, we delight to be gathered in your name and we pray that your light would would shine out from Zion to all people, to all homes and uh, to and brighten the futures of many. And by your spirit, Lord, you would woo your people to yourself. And we pray that as we open up your word, you would be blessed and we would be blessed. We ask this most humbly in the name of a risen Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, Vayishlach is, and he sent, which is the, uh, the opening sentence of the Torah portion. And um, it says, uh, Vayishlach Yaakov, and Yaakov sent Malachim, which is usually translated as uh, messengers, but it can also be translated as angels because that's exactly what happened two verses prior. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Have a look at Genesis 32, chapter uh, verse 1. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Right, and so there's this idea that the angels come have already met him, have already been interacting, and then and it says. Vayishlach, and he sent. So there's actually a Jewish tradition that says Jacob sends angels, right? The actual people are not men. They're not. They're not the spies. They're 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 angels. And uh, you might think, wow, how can humans um, control angels? And then you sort of realize that actually, that's actually one of their functions. They're servants. And uh, Jesus has has already told us in the in the New Testament, which is a Jewish book and Jewish understanding, that. We will rule or judge uh, angels, so they are the servants of the of the of God, and so are we. But in rank and order, we're actually higher. So Jacob sends his messengers. Could be uh, these divine beings that he had encountered, and they return <clears throat> saying that, "Hey, Esau, Esau is coming out to meet you." with 400 men. Ooh, ooh, the tension suddenly builds because our dysfunctional family, now let's remember that uh, the, the Bible <laughs> presents the, the heroes of God in, in, in light of dysfunctional families. There's not many cases where each of our families are normal. Okay, um, Maybe God doesn't like normal. <laughs> I'm sure he does, but he works within our weaknesses. Jacob and Esau have some family issues. And Jacob is a deceiver. Esau might be coming out for vengeance. He's not sure. Jacob is constantly, he's a person who's always afraid. And uh, so what does he do? He, uh, first of all, he prays. Uh, first of all, he prepares. He prepares for war. He divides his camp into two bits. And then he prays, and then he sends uh, peace offerings. And so that that order um, found here in this Torah portion is the order that um, the the rabbis, the the Jewish commentators, the Jewish exegetes uh, in the late Second Temple period will say: This is how you should always approach a conflict. Okay, whenever you have a conflict, whether it's national, whether it's intercommunal. Whether it's been like between denominations, whether it's in, into family, you know, a, a problem between tribes and and uh, and family, or but or whether it's just between friends, okay, the order's the same. Parabellum, prepare for war, prepare for the worst case scenario, okay. Um, make sure you're always ready. Don't be caught unawares. Get ready. 
just kind of interesting that we're in the season of Advent in the Christian calendar, which is all about getting ready. So, um, but get ready. Uh, and so there's a, a couple of Jewish sayings. Uh, one of them is always a favorite of mine. Um, if you know that your enemy is getting up early to come kill you, get up, up earlier. Okay? Get ready. Don't, don't be caught unawares. Or in the Latin, parabellum, prepare for war. If you want peace, prepare for war, is the, is the saying. Then he prays. Yes, that's one. Thing. We, we already know that. We always know that our first recourse to anything is to, to seek the, the Lord's counsel. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. Why not? Because you've already done it, right? Prepare, pray, as opposed to just pray, do nothing, okay? Because that's what some people do. Right? They'll pray. They go, oh, I've prayed about it. Now it's all in the Lord's hands. And you can imagine God in heaven going, really? You're not doing anything? Uh, we're talking right now, you and me, we're having a discussion, but you're not doing anything? Something's wrong with this picture. Prepare, pray, and then send a gift. Try and make peace. Try and calm the situation down. So the first thing that, uh, so he sends gifts, like lots of gifts, flocks, servants, okay, all kinds of things. And um, But then when they meet, they don't fight. They reconcile, and that's um, you know. So sometimes we often view the conflict here. You know, this is between Isaac and Ishmael. This is between Jacob and Esau. It's an ancient conflict, and blah blah blah. But the the Torah actually presents the dysfunctional families reconciling. Okay, Isaac and Ishmael reconcile. They they um and they reconcile so much. Okay, in the twelve hundreds, lots of rabbis are called Ishmael. Like it's not a dirty word, okay? They're living in and amongst the Muslim people. They're not hating them. They're not finding them evil, okay? And uh, and they're naming themselves and their sons Ishmael. It's not a dirty word. Uh, Esau is also synonymous with um, Edom, and uh, Moses says you are not to invade their territory. They're your brothers. Because let's remember who Esau is. Because a lot of us forget Esau is Jacob's brother which means he has exactly the same parents. His dad is Isaac, right? And his mother's Rachel. And um, um, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, sorry. And, uh, and, and so they have the same DNA, right? So we say Jacob's Jewish. Well, that means actually Esau's also Jewish, okay? He's a Hebrew. He doesn't change. His DNA can't change. He's, he's, and what do you think Isaac's going to teach him? Think Isaac's going to teach him to be a pagan? No, he's going to teach him about God. He's going to teach him everything Abraham taught him. And so Esau and his initial descendants are not bad guys. Okay, Hence Moses turns around and says, don't kill these people. Now, they go bad, that's true. But their start at this point right here is, is, is uh, he's a god fear. He has not run off to paganism yet. There's no evidence of that. Okay, um, and they reconcile, and uh, which is which is quite nice. And then um, you get this idea of Jacob wrestling with uh, the angel or something, and um, and, uh, and and it's interesting that with he's met angels in 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 verse one. He sent angels. Now he wrestles with an angel. So who is this? I hear you ask. Well, Christian theo. Uh, theology will always run to a theophany because that's what we do. Okay, anytime a divine being shows up, we go, "Oh, that's Jesus." Now, um, and so we have him wrestling Jesus. The, the text doesn't say that. Hosea the prophet, by the way, says it's a man. Okay, um, and uh, but the 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 later rabbinical commentaries they said that um, uh, every single nation has their own guardian angel or or divine angel that looks after them. You know, like Michael looks after uh, uh, Israel. So what you've got here is Jacob entering the territory of Esau. So he's wrestling the angel that guards Esau. Okay, and um, and and so they 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 sort of see it uh, in in that in that way. Uh, this is also the passage a second time that um, uh, Jacob gets his name change. Okay, the per he gets his name change um, here. And uh, uh, also when God comes to bless him and his name is 
change to Israel, which exactly what that means is not always clear. Typical Hebrew can mean multiple things. Uh, Yisrael, Yashar, can also can be mean straight, like straight with God. So anyone who's straight with God uh, is is good. Um, it can also mean seen by God, okay? so or sees God. So anyone who sees God is Israel, right? Sort of a more spiritual idea, where where um, Paul picks up on and sort of says, you know, look, is people, everybody who thinks Israel is not always Israel. Actually, you might be Israel, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because you've seen God. Um, and some will sort of take along the line that it. Uh, means struggle, which also it does, struggles with God. So, uh, it, which is also, it could be all of those things. It probably means all of them put together. So anyone who's really wrestling with God is um, a son of Abraham. Okay. Uh, then the, uh, unfortunately, the, the story switches and it, and, it, and it comes down to a very, very um, dark tale. In Genesis 34, which is the uh, story of Dinah. Now, Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter. They've only got the one girl here. And her name is Dinah, and she's from Leah, who produces also the Messiah, Judah. And uh, uh, Genesis 34 says, picks up um, by saying, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, uh, went out and of course, in, in typical Jewish fashion, which we are all learning uh, here, uh, the question starts is, went out from where? Like, where did she go out from? Where's she going out to? And obviously on the literal, you know, walked out of a tent and walked into Shechem. Okay? Um, uh, the place of Shechem in the Bible is 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 usually in comes in the context of something really horrible or negative. Not always. There's one really sh really shining point, and that's in the book of Joshua, where um, after Joshua has conquered uh, the land or or most of the hill country, doesn't conquer all of it. The Philistines are still there. He conquers a, a fair chunk of the hill hill territory, and after the battles have all subsided, uh, then he gathers the people at Shechem. And, and he enters into a covenant with them, uh, which is the same covenant of Sinai. I mean, it's no different thing. But he, he basically says, um, who wants to obey the Lord and who wants uh, uh, to, to, to serve God? And the, and the people say, we will. And they go and enters into a covenant. It's called the covenant of Shechem. Now, the rabbis or the Jewish commentators will say this is the best of covenants. Why? Because there's absolutely no reward attached to obedience you see um uh other the, the covenants that god gives with abraham and others is, is if you obey me you're going to get blessed if you do this then you're going to be blessed okay uh if you receive the torah you're going to be blessed okay these sort of sort of you know obedience uh, and gives you a reward but the covenant shechem there's no reward listed because you've already conquered the land right there's no if you follow me you'll conquer the land oh we already got it uh, what, what, what other promises you got there, Lord? It's a one-way strip where people just say, you're our God and uh, we're going to serve you and you don't need to give us anything. And so uh, the sort of, um, the, the rabbinical commentary is like, that's the type of attitude we have to have towards God. We can't be always coming to him saying, I'll, I'll, I'll believe in you, but, but you got to look after my kids, you know? Or, you know, I'll, I'll believe in you as long as you help me get that job promotion. It's like you know that that, that sort of uh, reward style uh, uh, doesn't appear at Shechem. So so even though it's got it's usually got bad connotations, and this is a bad connotation here in this Torah portion, it does have one or two little bright bits, and that's in uh, in Joshua. But here it's one of the low bits. So um, we're we're back in the land, we're in Shechem or. Um, what the present day Nablus and uh, and the daughter goes out. She went out from what? Father's protection. Went out from God looking for pagans. She like what is they, like what does she go out from? So they, so because it's unclear, then you're going to get 
uh, lots of different traditions. And so when you when you read the um, the midrashim, then you can kind of tell that uh, uh, the rabbi on that Sabbath has has focused on on this style. Maybe because he's trying to give a warning to his people. So one one rabbi will teach this way, another rabbi will teach this way, and it's, it's kind of interesting to see that multiple different servants can come out from from this. So she, she um, meets a Hivite, right? So the Canaanites are a mixed group of people. So this one's a, a Hivite, a Havi, and his name is um, his name is Shechem. So he's named after the city. Okay, maybe they kind of. Maybe all the princes were given that name. Okay? Um, and it's his Ben uh, Thamor, which is a real play on words in Hebrew, means son of a donkey. <laughs> Thamor is a donkey. So, you know, you're really getting getting um, a harsh name for him. Dina is the feminine of Dan. Okay? Judgment. Okay? So who's going to get judged here in this story? Okay, so you got a story about judgment. Who's getting judged? Well, <clears throat> we unfortunately have the incident of rape. He's a bit hot-blooded, and he has his way with the young lady. She's got no male protection. So she has deliberately gone out without males. Okay, She's got 12 brothers. She could easily have, have asked a couple to come along. Uh, she doesn't. So she's she's got herself into trouble. However, Shechem falls in love with her, right? The, the phrase here is that he begins to cling to her, or he He actually like sticks to her like glue, okay? And uh, so, so what is he doing? He's actually beginning, according to the Jewish tradition, okay? He's beginning to convert, okay? I like you. I like you, I like your family, I like everything about you, and I'm not going to leave you. That's the sort of energy that's coming out when um, when Shechem wants to cling to this girl. So uh, Jacob, on the other hand, uh, he's not he's not happy. And so he and Hamor, the donkey, okay, the father of uh, Shechem, they have a conversation. And uh, and um, the deal is, is that they'll get circumcised, right, and join the people of Israel. And way to go, okay? You've taken something dark, and what's the positive? The people of Israel are about to double in size, okay? You've got Jacob and his family and all their entourage, and then the entire town of Shechem. They're all going to become Jewish. They're all going to become God-fearers. Uh, they're going to become Jews. You can't lose. But... Unfortunately, we've got a couple of young hotheads in uh, Jacob's family, and it's uh, Levi, Levi, and uh, Shimeon, Simeon, and uh, in, they trick uh, the men, and they attack them when they're their weakest, and, uh, and they kill everybody. No one asked Dina if she thought that was a good idea, right? Like, there's no conversation where someone says, Dina, yeah, I know... Uh, it was a horrible incident, um, but he's a, he's a prince, and he, he could make a good husband. Do you want him as a husband? Do you want to be a princess? You will be a princess of an entire town. Um, and uh, But no one asks her, and instead, Levi and Simeon cast judgment on the town when Jacob's already done it. What was the judgment that he came down with them? You're going to convert and join our team. Okay, and instead of allowing them to do that, they get uh, the sons kill everybody. So it doesn't look good on on the sons, and so Jacob comes down heavily on them. Okay, so he gets uh, they do not do well, right? And so you end up with with um, uh, Levi and Simeon losing their place in uh, the order of uh, of the family. Simeon's tribal allotment is going to be tiny. So at the end of the day, all Simeon's land is, his tribal land, is Beersheba. And it's landlocked around Judah. Okay, so as, essentially he's absorbed by Judah. So you're not going to hear about him much, much at all. 
Okay. Um, and Levi doesn't get any land at all. Right? He's going to get just cities and he's going to become um, a servant, the servant of God and have and uh, the priesthood. Um, so they, they don't, they don't, uh, he doesn't do, do so well. And in fact, Simeon and Levi are going to be the ones that want to um, kill, kill Joseph in the next parasha. So they really not such good kids. Um, and so there's a, there's a bit of a, a judgment on it. It's a self judgment. It's a story that should have been a good story, but ended up um, coming, coming bad. And um, as part of the, the, uh, not the, um, uh, it's not Meda connected Meda, but it, the incident uh, continues to end poorly when, when Rachel dies after giving birth, um, to Benjamin. Okay. And, um, and, but Benjamin doesn't grow up to be so crash shot either. Okay. Not as a, as a, as a tribe. They end up nearly getting wiped out in a civil war, uh, because they, um, also have some issues with uh, sexuality and immorality, um, but they do produce the first king, and, and they produce one of the best of the apostles. Okay, so they have a, a small little little shining lights as well, but um, they 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 function poorly. Okay, so um, the the parasha concludes with a very detailed account of Esau's uh, wives, his children, his grandchildren. Okay, and um, and it says that in Genesis 36, okay, uh, 36, 31, let me just get that. Now, these are the kings who reigned over the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. And it, it lists them because Esau's name is also uh, Edom, or he, he gets classified as, as Edom. And uh, so there's kings of Edom before there are kings of Israel. Okay? That's how blessed that they are. Okay? So he reconciles. He's a God-fearer. And God blesses them with an empire before the children of Israel. So everybody who's who's working for the Lord okay, gets blessed. And uh, that's actually a good thing because um, we sometimes always look at other people and go, oh, always evil and all horrible. Actually, they're also getting 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 blessings and uh, they they settle uh, in the east Edom unfortunately ends up going poorly and the uh, Torah portion of uh, the Haftarah portion that is given uh, attached to this is from Ovadia Obadiah and uh, it's an interesting interesting parasha the, it's, a, it's one chapter long and Ovadia himself is a convert. Okay, so he was an Edomite who converted to Judaism, and uh, his name may not have been his 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 birth name, but it's the name that we understand him now. Uh, Ovadia can mean two things: it can mean slave or servant of God. Oved means servant, but uh, Avoda also means worship, so it could also mean worshiper of God. So probably means both, but that's the sort of idea. He really attached himself to the Lord, and he gets a vision, okay, a chazon. So he doesn't get the spirit of God, and and he but he sees something which he then has to go back and speak. So who better to speak to the Edomites? An Edomite, okay, and uh, the the Edomites as a nation, okay, were living in the east, uh, uh, but unfortunately for them, the uh, Nabataeans uh, began to expand. Uh, and they pushed the Edomites out of their land and moved them towards Judah. So they actually came into the in like sort of very close to the other side of the um, uh, Dead Sea, and actually what was once Judah's territory began to live there. And the Greeks, when they were running around ruling the world with Alexander, they named them the Idumeans. That was the Greek name for Edomites, and that's actually the way the world sort of kind of remembered them. From then on, and uh, uh, John Hyrcanos, who's one of the Maccabean uh, kings, and now that we're in the time of the Maccabees, uh, he uh, decided that he had he'd hit on this really cool idea of um, forced conversion. So he went around and said to them, you know, become Jews or die. And uh, they went, well, 
it's such a great opportunity. We should become Jewish, I think. And uh, they ended up uh, being converted and joining the um, people of Israel. And uh, the big, the descendant from that is King Herod. King Herod was an Edomite. Okay, so uh, his bloodline, in terms of his Jewishness, pretty thin. But his grandfather had converted, so therefore, technically, he is also Jewish. And uh, and we know where where that story ended up. Not so positive, but um, this this the um, Edom is. Um, uh, Obed Obadiah's vision to Edom and the reason it's attached to this Torah portion is because of Esau and Jacob reconciling. Later on, they have not. And so now you get the prophecy against them. And uh, this is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom. Okay? We've heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise, let's go against her for battle. So It's talking about some sort of... Uh, alliance that has come against Israel and Jerusalem. And Edom's joined in. Now, Edom hadn't done that before. Okay? But then they had joined in, they had begun to attack and and and, and, um, and uh, ransack Jerusalem. And uh, and so here's the gonna, now going to be the result. You're going to get punished for this. One of the punishments may have actually been the Maccabean um, conversion story. Okay? bit further uh, later down. Um, we don't really know the who Obadiah is in terms of like um, his backstory because there are 13 Obadiahs in Scripture. There was no idea which one he is. Um, and, and this prophecy that he gives hardly ever deals with Israel other than it's going to be its connection to the nations. Okay? This is very rare where a prophet comes along and doesn't talk about Israel. Normally, prophets are criticizing, right? You know, you're, you're chasing after other gods. You better get back on, on, on the path. You know, the Babylonians are coming. It's usually warning Israel. This one is like, let's talk to Edom. Right? And, uh, and, and why deal with just that nation? Why not the Ammonites? Why not the Moabites? Why not, you know, one of the other, and Egypt, to deal with anybody, but, but uh, here we're, we're dealing with this um, uh, cousin. Okay? They actually have a blood lineage link to the people of Israel in the past. And then they decided to attack. And, uh, um, and that's a, a bit poor. So uh, I'm going to make you small among the nations. And, and, and you'll be utterly despised. Okay? The pride of your heart has deceived you. That's uh, verse verse three. The pride of your heart. And this is actually, first of all, pride often starts in the heart. That's where, where it goes. And pride is always deceptive. It's never It never tells you the truth. It's a deceiving lie. Um, and, of course, who had that uh, on a level nobody else can fathom? Okay, the enemy. The, the the angel of God's presence who actually covered God and yet somehow convinced himself by deception that he could possibly defeat God and and probably still thinks he can win right there's, there's, that's how, how much pride this guy um, uh, possibly has okay you live in the clefts of rocks and make your homes on the heights if anyone has ever been to Petra okay then when you go to Petra, uh, there's, usually you go in the little um, uh, uh, Indiana Jones entrance, okay, and that brings you to the Treasury Building, which is like the famous iconic um, uh, building in Petra. Even though Petra is huge as a site, takes you days to explore. Um, you, you actually can take a path up to the right, and it, you, it's a walk. No donkey will take you up there. But if you actually do get to the top, you're in an Edomite um, castle, and um, and it's right on the top. And is built into the clefts of rocks. So this guy knew what he was talking about. He's giving you a direct reference. They lived up the top where the eagles saw and uh, was incredibly well defensible, which means their little nation could actually be a superpower because you just physically couldn't capture them. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, and though you saw like eagles and make your nest amongst the stars from there, I'll bring you down. But they were eventually... Eventually, they um they came down, 
Um, and they'll come down because of verse 10. You'll see in verse 10, because of the violence against your brother, Jacob. Okay, so the, the prophet is still giving a blood connection to Edom and calling them um, um, quite closely related. And, uh, and because of that, you'll be covered with shame and you'll be destroyed forever. And uh, which eventually is, is, is done by the uh, Maccabeans, the, the Hasmonean uh, group. Okay. Or in, uh, in Hebrew, it's the concept of measure for measure. Medar, Keneged, Medar. You try to do this, that's going to happen to you. Okay. Or it, as uh, Paul would say in Galatians, you reap what you sow. Now, you might think, okay, so we've we're the hot, uh, we've got a whole bunch of verses against uh, uh, against Edom. Then in in uh, in in verse fifteen, it switches. The day of the Lord is near. Okay. For all nations, all of a sudden you you flip from looking at Edom and you go universal. Very, very common for the Psalms and the prophets to do this. The day of the Lord is here for all nations. Now we're going to talk to all nations. For as you have done, it'll be done to you, measure for measure. Okay? As it has been as you have done, it'll be done to you. Okay? Think about the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me as I have forgiven. That is a that is a very old Jewish concept, theological concept. Okay? The way you behave is the way the Lord will deal with you. The mercy you show, the mercy God is going to give give you. Okay. Um, now, some people go, oh, that sounds like works righteousness. No, 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 no. It's relationship. Big, big difference between those things. And uh, the Lord says here, okay, as you've done, it'll be given to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. But it's for all the nations. Okay. The, the rule applies to everybody. And... Uh, just as you drank on my holy hill, okay, you, you came and you helped to burn Jerusalem, okay, then uh, the, uh, all, all the nations are going to drink from you. They're going to destroy. Uh, verse 17, but on Mount Zion, okay, this is a, a very physical place, will be deliverance, it'll be holy, and Jacob, which is a person, the people of God, will possess his inheritance. So the Israel the, and, and the people, Israel the people and Israel the land, are often paired together in the Psalms and in the prophets. They're inseparable. Okay? Uh, uh, the, the, we can see in the world today that they just cannot comprehend that, that Israel is, is both a people and it's a land. And there is a connection between the two. It's a very deep connection, very, very strong connection. And, uh, and it's a connection that's bound up also by the living God. Okay? And, uh, and so, and the soonest anybody understands that, the better. I was uh, struck uh, by that um, last week uh, when Micah was out of Gaza for a week, then because we were in a ceasefire, and um, the army probably had to try and figure out what to do with all the soldiers. So they put them on some training, did some stuff, but they also made them go out into the fields to harvest the fruits and vegetables because we have a rather sh large shortage of Thai workers these days. And um, and so a lot of these crops were just starting to go bad. And Melody and Gavin have done it. Okay, A lot of people did, but the army did as well. And I was struck by this thought thinking, wow, Israel's gone out to take care of Israel. Nice. You know, the, the, the which was kind of spiritually nice. So Ovadia... Um, very short, very direct, um, talks about Edom, the brother of, of, of Jacob, very closely related, who had done something bad, but it probably started so good. But yet, um, the, the, what happens to him has universal application. Okay? You go out from your immediate. And that still is a strong Jewish theme. Take whatever's happening local and go beyond yourself. So, if you have a sore leg and you want to pray for your sore leg, do that. But then think about that there's other people out there in the world who have sore legs. Probably should pray for them too. So you actually extend what you're doing and you extend out. Um, and you do that um, every time you have a, you say the blessing for food. It's called the Birchat where you thank the Lord for the food you ate 
and then you thank the Lord for the food everybody else eats, even if they're not going to say thank you. Okay, you, you, the Lord gives you food, but He also gives everybody else food. So you, there's always that uh, um, uh, way where you you take something very personal and you extend it beyond yourself, and that's seen here in uh, the Haftarah portion as as well. Okay, so then uh, the next uh, section is is uh, Vayashev, where uh, we're settling. Okay, well, Yeshev means and, and he do, in he, and he dwelt. But he only got dwelt for a while because eventually we're going to get a famine. We're going to have to uh, send head south. <clears throat> and um, uh, Jacob comes and he settles in Hebron, okay, which is a contentious city these days, but it has a, has had a very very strong Jewish presence with um, Abraham, okay, who had bought the cave of uh, of a. Uh, um, uh, from one of his friends, because uh, he'd been sitting by the oaks of uh, Mamre, which in Jewish commentary is a person, not a place. Okay, uh, Abraham's got some some friends there, and um, Jacob has a favorite son, Joseph, and Joseph is uh, a bit of a dreamer, and he has dreams and he has visions, and he, you know what else he is? He's a talker. He tells tales, right? Because he, uh, in I'll read the first couple of verses. Now, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan, right? And then um, the children of Israel are all going to marry Canaanite wives. They're actually going to get the name of one in this Torah portion, okay? So that um, uh, there's, that they at at Jacob, the family stops going out to find wives from their family they, like, so you know like Isaac and Jacob you, you found their partners by going back to the original family in Haran and finding finding some brides they don't do that anymore now they're going to find their brides uh, from here in the land and they're going to come into the family so they're going to convert and join the family like Shechem should have right but, but, but uh, uh, unfortunately we wiped him out um so uh, Joseph is seventeen years old, and um, but it, which is it, but the verse two says this is the history of Jacob, and the history of Jacob is his son. Right, you're you're known through your children. Right, it's generation goes on to generation. What we do affects the people coming up after us. Now, most of the modern culture can't think beyond themselves. Or today, and, and most of them don't even want kids. Ancient cultures know exactly what I'm talking about. And so that includes, I'm going to assume, First Nations, which knows that you're part of a people, you're part of a story, you're part of a land, and you're in you know, it. That story goes on from generation to generation. Well, the history of Jacob is lived out through his kids. And here we have another dysfunctional family Joseph's 17 year old. Uh, he was feeding the flock with his brothers. The lad, okay, uh, was with the sons of Bilha and the sons of Z Zilpah. These are the concubines, okay. Uh, his father's wives, they're called wives, but they're concubines. And Joseph brought a bad report. Okay. So what's he got? Lashon Hara, okay. Uh, um, he's a tattletale. Guy can't keep his mouth shut. And uh, it's going to get him into trouble. Okay, you're going to see this played out all through the Bible. Guard your tongue. And um, uh, you don't need James chapter 3 to tell you. So uh, unfortunately, he's got uh, some issues. <clears throat> he brings a bad report. Just like the 10 spies. Same phrase. The 10 spies gave a bad report. And something, and it's going to be, um, and uh, Jacob, uh, Joseph actually ends up calling his his uh, his brothers when they come to him in Egypt. He calls them spies, okay, just like the ten the, the ten spies that that were, that are going to come later in in uh, Exodus. But um, so it's it's interesting. You reap um, what what you sow. So 
so he's he has dreams and and he could have just kept them to himself but oh no he's got to deliver bad reports and lord it over his his um his family and unfortunately uh some things happen and it's Simeon and Levi. They plot to kill him. Reuven, who's the oldest, who should have said no, okay, uh, suggests that they throw him into the pit and they sell him. And who do they sell him to? Ishmaelites, right? Right. They're they're, they're uh, the people of the the people of Isaac are still dealing with the people of Ishmael, right? They're not mortal enemies. Um, and where's Ishmael going? They're heading off to Egypt. Why are they heading off to Egypt? Because Ishmael's wife. Well, first of all, Ishmael's mother's Egyptian, so he's an Egyptian, and he married an Egyptian, so Ishmael's an Egyptian. Okay? They're not Arabs at all. Right? So they're on their way to Egypt while you live at home. And um, they might have been nomadic traders, but they're also um, Egyptians. And uh, and then you get that whole, uh, 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 Joseph is cast down into into Egypt. And um, and so he gets, when when, the Jewish people in the Second Temple period are wrestling with who is the Messiah because they've been looking at the text and they're seeing all these messianic characters that are supposed to come. Elijah's supposed to come and um, uh, the prophet like God's supposed to come and uh, this, there's this suffering servant who's supposed to come and then there's this, this powerful war figure that's supposed to come. They can't figure it out. So they split Messiah into two parts. Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Why Joseph? Why not call him one of the other sons? And they do it because he's the guy that goes and suffers. He went down into, into Egypt. He went to go live with the Gentiles. Right? So Messiah ben Joseph goes to live with the Gentiles. Where do you find Messiah in the uh, Jewish Midrashim? In, with the Gentiles. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? Okay, so, um, uh, but before we pick up that story, we have to go and uh, have another um, um, problem. So Tamar, uh, so Judah, has um, married a Canaanite wife, and he, she actually got a name. Very rare, okay? Shua is uh, her name, and uh, but she dies a bit uh, young. Produces a couple of kids, no problem, okay. Um, but uh, but doesn't uh, um, doesn't live very long. And one of them marries a lady called Tamar, but then dies, okay. Uh, but doesn't say why. It just says that um, uh, the Lord slew them, okay. So if you have a look at um, what is it? It's uh, verse 7 of 38. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. doesn't say what he was doing. But Judah obviously is um, unable to control his kid. And the Lord killed him. Okay, This raises all kinds of questions. Uh, why? What did he do that was so bad that the Lord would kill him and not other wicked people? Like, you know, there's wicked people all over the planet. Why are we, why are we picking on this kid? Right? Um, why don't we kill Shechem before he rapes Dina? Right? You got lots of. So the, the, the text doesn't say. So if the text doesn't say, what do you do? Well, yeah, make it up. Okay, so this guy, he's he's practicing black magic. He's figured out the holy name of God, how he stole that from Judah. No one's got a clue. And before he gets to use it, the Lord smites him. Okay, so he definitely needed to, to go down. Um, and then uh, Onan uh, comes along. And because uh, it's the it's the it's the um, the rule that uh, the bro brother's got to keep. Um, the brother has to produce an heir for the brother so that um, Ur's lineage can continue. Although with such a Rasha, such an evil person, why would you want to? Um, maybe Onan knew okay, that uh, his brother's a bad seed, so we, he doesn't do his job and he dies off as well. And, um, and, uh, and so 
um, Judas losing sons left, right, and center. And uh, so you can imagine on his side of the table where he says, hey, listen, we're not going to give any more kids for this for this lady. Okay. And so he actually says, no, please, you know, just put on some um, uh, widow's clothing and you can have one of my sons when they come of age. Okay. Imagine that, how that works out when you're 15 years old. Yeah. Okay. And your new wife's going to be about 40. Um, anyway, uh, like you'd want to be liking older women for your, for your tastes. Hey, but anyway, so, so the Judah uh, gets tricked by Tamar. Okay. And, uh, and so he does something poorly. She seems to do something right, but the the way she does it seems to be something bad. And but in the same parasha, you also have another lady who tr is trying to trick a man and sleep with him, and that's Potiphar's wife, and Joseph. Joseph gets bought by um, uh, a pretty high ranking official in the uh, Egyptian court, and um, he seems like he's a pretty handsome man. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but his wife oh, really cool. wants to, um, seduce him and he resists. Okay. So Ta Tamar seduces J Judah and succeeds and Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph and fails. So you've got these, uh, um, these, uh, really different me. responses by the men. Okay. So Joseph, he can resist the temptation. Judah can't. Okay. Uh, and remember, from this union comes the Messiah, right? Uh, this is one of those parts of the story where you go, why is this even in the story? Because this is in the direct lineage of Jesus, the direct lineage of the Messiah. And um, it, it's, it's got all kinds of interesting questions. The... the, um, the there are positive and negative aspects of all the women and men in these stories. Okay, each of them's got issues, so none of them is crystal clear here. Okay, first of all, Joseph's a tattletale, right? You know, and he's got as a dreamer, and um, and and his lashon hara has got him into lots of trouble, but now he's doing a lot better. Okay, he says, you know, I can't, t I, I can touch anything in my master's house, but not this. Okay, but the rabbis. Just so you know, the, the Jewish sages, they, they feel sorry for Potiphar's wife. And you go, huh, they, real feel, they feel sorry for all the women in the story. Okay? They feel sorry for, for Dina because her, her prince got wiped out when she could have been princess. Okay? They feel sorry for, for Tamar because she got married to some husband who's just evil. Okay? Um, and Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, What's wrong with her? I hear you ask. And uh, why is she having to go to um, chase Joseph? Why doesn't she feel satisfied with her husband? And what's the rabbinic answer? Because he's gay. How's that one for, for coming right out of the books? Hey, they'll say that um, this Egyptian, you know, because like there's no kids mentioned in the story. Right? It's not like that she's got any kids. And so they say, oh, man, like, they feel real sorry for her. And, and, of course, Joseph's really attractive. And, um, you know, why would you not want to be with such a tzaddik, you know, such a righteous person? And, uh, but, of course, he, um, he resists. So they, they, they actually put a nice slant on her. They don't sort of cast her off to be someone, someone evil. Okay. Um, uh, but so that's the, 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 and then Joseph goes back into prison or because he's, um, and he ends up having a couple of dreams. It's all about dreams. So when you want to go and have a, a, a Torah portion for yourself, they rush to Zechariah, although there is a Sephardi tradition, there's also there's Amos. Um, Zechariah 2. Where's my Zechariah? And um, starting chapter 2.14. This is right at the end. And um, 
the 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 image there is that um, you get uh, uh, there's a high priest, a guy called Joshua. Oh, well, first of all, God is going to choose Jerusalem again. So sing, daughter of Zion, I'm coming. The nations will be joined to the Lord. So there's this, this apocalyptic future where the, uh, Israel and the nations are bound together. In the prophets, there always are. Remember, you start off within yourself and then you go out. And uh, you we saw that in Ovadia. And now we see it here again. Um, my people and I, we're going to dwell together. That's a beautiful promise. And the Lord will take possession. He will again choose Jerusalem, which of course then uh, uh, starts asking the question: Why did he? What? What? What happened that um, made God not choose Jerusalem? Right? He chose Jerusalem, and then he had to choose them again. So how did they become unchosen? Like what happened? And so this is it's a, it's a deep question, and um, and it's one that the Jewish people ask of themselves. Um, so there's, there's the prophetic hope that they are the people of God or that they will be the people of God again. Um, and it's, it's a choice where that the Lord makes. It's not their choice. It's a choice that God is making. Um, so why is he doing this? I mean, what have we done in the first place? Um, and the, the, the concept, and you see it in, in the, the, the wanderings in the wilderness, sin drives away the presence of God. Right, so so God gets His people out of Israel. He asks them to build the Mishkan so that He can live in them. The Lord's glory at the end of of, of Shemot fills the place so much so that none of the priests, not even Moses, can get inside. Okay? God is living with His people. It's fantastic. But then sin drives God away. Right, and uh, uh, highlighted by the by Ezekiel. Where the glory of the Lord departs the temple, right, and then just leaves it empty. And uh, this this sort of idea that uh, um, in our relationship with God, He is merciful, He is kind, He is long suffering, He is all of these things, and He's the one doing the choosing. You know, we're we're, we're the ones that are chosen, etc. But it's relational. How are we relating to God? How like you know if 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 we want God to be merciful to us, then we had better be merciful. If we want God to be faithful to us, then we need to be faithful, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's this reciprocal relationship, but at the same, and, and, and part of that reciprocal relationship is in our holiness. And if we're not being holy, then how can we possibly expect a holy God to live with us? Like it just, it just can't happen. And, uh, but yet the prophet turns around and says, Listen, there's going to come a time when the nations are going to convert, right? They're going to come and join the people of God. They're going to they're going to be attracted to 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 the holy hill. Something about Jerusalem is going to make them attractive again, which is of course what you see. You know, you know, you have the feast of, of tabernacles, and it is the nations are there. I mean, it's a fantastic day in Jerusalem, um, and uh, and God Himself says, and I'm choosing Jerusalem as well. The nations will, and I will. And I'm going to live with my people, and it's going to be going to be really good. And then you get this vision. Uh, and again, uh, remember, a lot of these prophets they have visions and they see things. Um, they're not, as we would understand it, filled by the Spirit. The two prophets that definitely are filled by the Spirit, okay, is Elijah and Elisha, and uh, and John the Baptist, by the way. <laughs> Okay, um, from birth, right? I mean, from from in, in, into utero, right? He gets the Holy Spirit inside while he's in, inside the womb. It's a very special um, uh, character. Uh, and uh, the Septuagint describes the same way for Samuel, by the way. So when Hannah uh, um, uh, has has her baby, then the then the the Greek version adds, he's got the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they they kind of understood that some of these prophets that um, that don't write books, okay, Elijah and Elisha and Samuel, okay, even though we got books called Samuel, he doesn't write them. Um, they get uh, the Holy Spirit. Jesus has the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't write a book. I mean, he is the book, but you know what I mean. He doesn't physically write a, a gospel. So uh, we get this vision uh, of our prophet, and he gets to see Joshua, Yehoshua. 
Joshua. Okay, so it's uh, already a loaded term. <laughs> However, uh, concurrent, okay, he's serving with um, uh, the prophet Haggai. And uh, Haggai, in, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, it describes that the high priest of that day, the Kohen Gadol, was Joshua, okay, Yehoshua. Uh, so he sees a vision of Yehoshua standing before the angel of the Lord. So this heavenly scene. So the, the, this human priest ooh, is in front of the Lord. Wow. Okay, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, where have we seen that sort of thing before? But when we say standing before the Lord, that doesn't mean just um, standing. Standing before the Lord means doing your service. Okay? When they come and stood before the Lord, they actually were doing the temple service or the, the tabernacle service. So the high priest here is serving God. There's a human serving the Lord in heaven. Wow, that's funky. Okay, and uh, But who else is there? Satan, the enemy, okay? which is a, the, the same sort of court scene that you actually see in Job as well, but minus the, the high priestly figure. And Satan's there as well, and, and he's accusing, right? And he's doing his job. So everyone has that is, is in this vision doing their job. And um, he's, uh, it's a rare appearance by Satan. You rarely, rarely see him in the Bible. Okay, um, He's all over the place in medieval literature. But in the Bible, he doesn't show up very much. Um, even in the in Revelation, he doesn't show up very much, right? In the Gospels, he's hardly there. He shows up a little bit, and at the at the start of Jesus' ministry, shows up a little bit at the end of Jesus' ministry, and pretty much he's not 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 there very much. Okay, um, Revelation, again, he's there a little bit, but not so much. He works. His power, remember, is lies and deceit and accusations okay it, he's not running around slaying whole nations and things like that that's we're doing that okay? um uh so he sits there and he accuses and um uh and the and it's interesting verse two the lord says to satan right? the lord rebuke you <laughs> what a, what an interesting thing for god to say God says, God rebuke you. Uh, well, who's God then? Well, ask me, but I didn't want to say I'm rebuking you. But um, it, there's the phrase, the Lord rebuke you. And who uses that? Well, we should all use it. Michael, the angel, uses it. Okay. And uh, that's the, the, even the Lord uses that phrase. So the name of the Lord is very powerful. Hence the reason why um, the sort of ultimate sin is uh, stealing the name of God. Okay, which is the charge the Talmud gives Jesus, but it's also the one that they they, they wanted Ur to do. So, uh, unfortunately, Joshua doesn't have the appropriate clothing on. That's a shock, because he's supposed to be the high priest. He, we know what he's supposed to be wearing. He's wearing blue, purple, and scarlet, right? He is, like, his uniform's well laid out in the Bible. He has some sort of turban on his head with the name of God on it. Right, you know, gold and gems, and, and he's supposed to be looking good. Somehow, he's wearing, he's not wearing the the, the appropriate appropriate garments, and uh, and so um, they uh, they they replace the, his clothing, and um, and the clothing is then become synonymous with iniquity or sins, and so you get. Then clothing becomes um, a metaphor for righteousness. You know, like the white robes you get in heaven you know, the, is is righteousness. The, and what is a sin? How do you do a sin? By something you do. How do you get righteousness? By something you do. Right? It's not just a state of thinking. It's not just you know I thought about it, and so therefore I'm you know I thought about doing good. It's a, these are things you you, know, you you did, and then they, and uh, so the bad sins are replaced by rich robes, and unclean becomes clean, and then he gets a clean turban, or some sort of head ornament. Some translation I did see one translation. I uh, come to which one said a mitre. Uh, that that you know those crazy things that the bishops wear, but um, they they. 
the priests or the high priests wore something on their heads. They had their heads covered when in the presence of God. Uh, and there are some denominations that still require men to do that, right? um, which is this is probably where the source of that, that comes from. Uh, the, the, the vision here, uh, the angel of the Lord says, um, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, there you are again, walk, halakha, cholech, do something, not just think about me, but actually put it to practice. If you will keep my commandments, if we haven't quite figured it out, that uh, faith is an action, okay, then you will judge my house. And you'll have charge of my courts. Think about that. You know, God is constantly wanting to share his power. He wants to share his responsibility. He wants to share his work. He makes the garden. And then says, Adam, take care of it. He creates the world and then says to man, you now rule it and, 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 and take charge. Okay? I could do it. Of course I could. I've got married angels. They could all do it for me. I'm partnering with you. I could tell everybody about the gospel, but you're going to do it. So come and join my side of the table. And not only that, I'll put you in charge. Like the way uh, Joseph took took charge of of, of Potiphar's house, okay? and uh, and so God is very very generous. And I've got a feeling we don't sometimes appreciate how generous God really is with uh, with us. And because uh, we often want, um, you know, bless me, Lord, and give me stuff here, and, and you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then God's going, I actually really want you to be in charge of everything. You know, why are you limiting yourself here? And um, and so we need to have that. That uh, that sort of view that uh, we're in charge, we're taking. God is sharing His His kingdom with us, and I'll give you places to walk among those who stand here. This sort of this God's going to guide, God's going to lead. We're not going to be by ourselves. There's going to be others around. Okay, and at the moment, meanwhile, the accuser is doing his thing, but he's been rebuked. Uh, and I, I love the 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 phrase. It's probably not a coincidence because coincidence is not a kosher word, right? That the high priest we're talking about here is Joshua, Yehoshua, the sort of Yeshua, the same words that are being being played out here, and um, and uh, you and your companions, because Joshua is not alone. Okay, they all what here is here is a wondrous sight. Behold, I am going to bring forth my servant. Okay, again, the the Jewish people you know, in the second temple period they looked for these characters. They 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 know that they're there. My servant, the tzemach, okay, the branch, and um, uh, Isaiah four talks about this. Isaiah eleven talks about the branch. Jeremiah talks about the branch in uh, twenty three five and thirty three fifteen. These are some of the other times where the word branch is used, and in all cases, it's a messianic sign, and uh, and so um, it's 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 known that I am going to bring forth the Messiah, and. Uh, uh, I've, whom, whom and he's a, he's a stone, he's an Evan, and he's got eyes. That is a really weird thing, but um, and he has an inscription which says the Lord of Hosts. Now, in in these vision sequences, there's 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 the the the, the name of God is imprinted on their heads, sometimes on their hearts, sometimes on their rocks. Um, that, that it's a vision sequence. We're not we don't 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 go literal, but the the idea of of having the, the name of God engraved. The name of God is powerful. Um, and uh, and in doing that, I'm going to remove iniquity uh, of the land. Remember, the people and the land are always synonymous. Israel is a people. Israel is a land. The sins of the people will be, co will be covered, but so will the land. Right since the beginning, our connection with the earth is is unique. Adam sinned in the earth was cursed. You do you look after the earth and he rebel rebounds back. Okay, you plant crops, he grows. Okay, um, and, and and as Paul says, creation is, is growing for its redemption. The earth itself is looking forward to the time when sins go away and iniquity is gone and everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. And the Lord comes back and actually lives on the planet too. The earth is looking forward to that. Uh, 
and uh, and and then there'll be um, in that day everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Let's remember that right since the beginning, um, you actually can't have worship without food. Okay, the wor worship of God, the love of God, the presence of God always involves around food. And uh, that's why all the festivals have a food element, except one, okay, okay, Judaism does have fasts, but there's only the one major festival, Yom Kippur, where you don't have food, but everyone's looking forward to when, when it finishes. But, uh, um, and so in the early church, the early believers, who were Jews, remember, the Jewish believers in Jesus, Yeshua, when they would get together, what, what, does, it, what does Acts say that they did? They got together daily for the prayers, the fellowship, and for the breaking of bread, right? Worship and food. Uh, and that's why in the traditional churches, that's why you have communion every time you meet, okay? Because because they they just they the early the early church fathers they were they couldn't imagine any time you would would get together and not break bread. Okay, or not have communion. That was just a, a part. And the same here in the prophetic. You're going to invite your neighbors under your vine and fig tree. What are you going to do? You're going to eat. You're going to talk. You're going to fellowship uh, uh, with them. And uh, so the, the land and the people are always paired together. And uh, and even the iniquity that was attached to the land because of us okay, goes, goes away. And then uh, the angel uh, who talked with me came back and awakened me. And uh, so now he get, he's, he's up from his vision experience and the, and the angel is still with him. Because remember, where do angels uh, operate? On the planet, right? Uh, in the dream sequences, they're always um, ascending and descending. They're, they're, uh, uh, even uh, Elijah v reveals his servant and says, look, look how many are with us then against us. They're, they're here. So... And they have the communication. What do you see? And uh, he says, I'm looking. And there is a, a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl. Lamp, seven, seven lamps and pipes and seven. And so he sees a menorah. He actually sees a vision of the temple. Okay, or he sees something again. And what does he see? There's olive trees on either side who are supplying oil for the menorah. Okay. Um, and and, and uh, so I, he, he asks the angel now, what are these? And the angel uh, talked with me, answers is, do you not know what they are? I go, no. Right? How, how many times do you get these rhetorical questions by angels? Okay. And they ask you, who, who, what do you see? I have no idea what I'm, what I'm looking at. Um, why did you ask me in the first place? Okay. But you've got my attention. Uh, what, who, what are we looking at? This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. This is the guy who builds right, the, uh, the, the, the temple upon return. This is the second temple, which unfortunately wasn't as glorious as everybody wanted it to be, but it is the one that the Maccabees rededicate. Okay, so um, the one that Jesus was in okay, is Herod's version. And uh, but this is a so the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay, so uh, the even though, and and I and I and I, and I find this some um, this theology to be very very powerful and and unbelievably subtle. Faith is something you do. Yes. Walk out with me. Yet, even though it's still something you do, you remember that you were chosen first. You didn't get to, you didn't choose. You were chosen. And it's not by might or power that we're doing these walking out. Okay. Because then it starts to become perhaps a hint of work, works righteousness. They soften it. They say, it's all done by my spirit. Okay? It still plays out. You still do something. But it's by the spirit of God. You'll build buildings. 
you'll 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 settle the land you'll plant the the vineyards and and you'll defeat your enemies but it's the spirit of god which will actually be doing these things and in fact what do we really want people to do in the, as we've seen in the parasha we actually want them to convert right we want shechem to actually become a believer you weren't supposed to kill him he was supposed to join the jewish people right that um uh the the Ovadiah says all the nations are going to come okay we've we've chastised edom but then all the nations are going to 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 receive salvation and again the same the nations of the world by the spirit of god are going to delight in jerusalem the lord's going to delight in his people he's going to delight in his holy mountain he's going to live, to live with them but by we're going to be to be joining in there's actually yes uh, it's it's subtle but it's um it's actually quite powerful uh and i think that uh um, you know, it's enough for me right now because I want some conversation from you guys. But I think that the um, the the way that we 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 see the Torah portion because your people are walking out their faith in the Torah portion, or they're physically doing something, um, and they're not always getting it correct. And then the prophets come along, right? And they sort of constantly they remind us that there's a spiritual side to the walking out, and the two need to be married up. Yeah, you got but but at the end of the day, it's not not about power and and might, and God is powerful and God is mighty and He can do all kinds of things, but the way He prefers to operate is by His Spirit. It's a very interesting thing for Him to do. All righty. Everybody should unmute themselves, and. Uh, Let's discuss the prophets. Aaron, I have a question. About, yes. Uh, well, thanks for the teaching. Uh, in Obadiah, we read in verse 15 that the day of the Lord is near. What's your take on that phraseology, that nearness? You know, we're thousands of years after Obadiah. Yeshua used that same terminology. And we're he thousands did. of years that, and yet it's called nearness. Yes, yes. So um, the 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 phrase uh, "yamim achorim," the last days, okay, actually occurs in Genesis. We haven't got up to it yet. Um, Forty nine. Okay, it's where Jacob. Wait, let's read it right now because we're because we've got it because it's a fascinating subject. Um. Genesis 49. Okay. Jacob. So Jacob calls his sons and says, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Okay. So that's for the first time you actually get the phrase, Ba'acharit Hayamim, the last days, okay, the, the end times. Okay. And um, and they're already being told why to the sons of Israel, sons of Jacob. And what does he do? He blesses them. Now, within the blessings, some of them are not so good. So the last days involves a blessing and it involves curses. And the next time you hear the phrase, um, uh, the last days, it's, Bal, it's Balaam, okay? where he's trying to curse Israel, and he's failing miserably. Okay, so he's going out to curse, and he ends up doing a blessing. So the 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 nuance that's attached to the last days is it's both a blessing and a curse. It runs around the same time, and um and then, but the timing of these things doesn't seem to mean the end, and so um uh the. But they apply to the nations, which is what we see in Avodiah. Okay, the uh, uh, what does Obadiah say in fifteen? The day of the Lord is near for all nations. So what they do is you take the last days and they become sort of not sure exactly what the time period is. Peter seems to think in Acts chapter two that he's in the last days because he's quoting Joel, and the last days have been going on for quite a time. But then what they do is that they then a, give you another uh, phrase, the day of the Lord, the Yom Adonai. And uh, what is the day of the Lord? And uh, is that 
and it's and again it has both a blessing and a and a and a judgment component to it and they can't figure out its timing the prophets say it but it doesn't seem to to end the the final final judgment scenes okay uh, they're not called the day of the lord it's the judgment scene you see in daniel and it's the judgment scene you see in revelation it involves a court scene and it involves books right in both revelation and in daniel when god starts opening those books that's it right that's when he goes right what have we got here and um you see it in revelation and you see it in um in uh in uh, in daniel prior to to the opening of the court scenes you in revelation you've got seven bowls of this seven trumpets of that you know you've got this sort of long drawn out um cataclysmic event in daniel it's um linked to uh the this 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 um weeks and 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 sets of seven uh and and so there's this his, his calendar is quite specific a bit more specific than perhaps revelation is um here ovadia doesn't give it a timing he just says it's kowalv it's close and um, whatever close means, but it's for all the nations. Okay, he prophesies against Edom, but it takes. Uh, depending on when we think of Aji is, let's just let's just think that this is uh, still at the end of the destruction. It's not the destruction of the temple; it's the bit before that. It's the it's the um, an Assyrian invasion. So you're look, looking. What have we got? Six hundred years before the Maccabees, and um, and and that's uh, and then finally we deal with the uh, with Edomites, um, but they're still around <laughs> because King Herod shows up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the the Bible has um there's is we constantly say well this is the last you know, the dot on the sentence, and then we realize that in Hebrew. You don't have punctuation, right? There's, there's just you, you. So it that's not a good answer, other than it's a circular reasoning to say, you know what, it's closer than yesterday. That's about, that's about as much as we're going to be able to conclude. But uh, it involves blessings, it involves curses, and it involves the nations. As soon, when, when God starts opening those books, then the show's over. Right. Thanks. Which makes um, which makes uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah, the days of war, and Yom Kippur, a really powerful event when you think about it, because they're yeah. they're they're wanting to make sure their signatures are, are in the right right books. So is Esau still with us? Is Esau still with us? Good question. Um, so technically, many of them were absorbed into what we today call Judah, so Judites. So technically, the answer will be yes. Um, uh, how much of that, uh, how, how much is there? There's going to be nobody will be able to be, to be, to be able to 100% say but uh, technically, uh, once the Maccabees had force converted, they joined the people of Israel. They joined Judah. The rabbis associate Esau with the church. They eventually did. So what they did is, so Esau becomes Edom, which we see in the prophets, right? And uh, and then in in the in the Talmud, um, in the in the, in the in the rabbinic writings, which later become Talmud and, and other texts as well, they can't say the word Rome, okay? Because they're under the control of Rome. Rome owns the world or the known world. So uh, they use a code word, Edom. And uh, so Rome is Edom in, in, um, in, the, in the Talmud. And initially, Rome is pagan, okay? It's because it's, it's persecuting Christians initially. And it's and for the first and then three hundred years later, Rome becomes Christian. 
So then Edom becomes a synonymous for for uh, the church. But when you read Talmud, you've got to try and figure out which time period they're talking talking about because sometimes they're actually talking about pagan rome and sometimes they're talking about um uh, the church of rome um although here's the other thing rome fell right in 440 so uh and and so christianity was actually in the hands of north africans um and uh, uh so or a lot of your early church fathers okay um they're all african in fact, uh, when you look at the list of popes, one of them's black. Uh, he was called Africanus. Guess where he was from? And uh, and and uh, and so the center of power began to shift to uh, Constantinople, Latinized into a word called Byzantium, um, and it wasn't until uh, Irish missionaries rebrought the gospel back to uh, Europe. It was called the Dark Angels. It all went dark. And um, and then Islam came out of the jungles, the desert, and destroyed North Africa. And so it took Europe quite a long time to get its feet back together. And so it ended up that being the Eastern Orthodoxy was the powerhouse, right? So um, and that was that was the they lasted for a thousand years after Rome, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the German Reich wanted to last a thousand years. Byzantium did, and they sent missionaries everywhere. And so you ended up with um, Egyptian Coptic, you know, Ethiopian Orthodoxy, uh, all the Baltic Orthodoxies, uh, uh, Russian Orthodoxy. They, they evangelized huge chunks of land. Um, and then they all get inundated by Islam. And then the West has cropped up again. And... Uh, and so sometimes we often think of Christianity as just being this Western thing and just like only for the last four or five hundred years. And and not only that, we were too busy having a good reformation around the same time as well, right? Um and uh, you know, and so the the the, the history of the churches is, is that it's had this little little swing. And uh what I find uh ironic but also interesting is that as the West is falling. And the East is still under Islam. Where does the uh, where's Christianity rising again? Africa and, and China, but Africa. You know, this sort of it's playing out where where uh, the the Africans are and, and their doctrines are pure. They don't. They they've got their churches are a mess. Okay, but but um, they believe in the truth and they love Israel. You know, they read their Bible and they go, no, no, no. We know we know what it says. Don't understand it, but we know what it says. And um, so I think that they'll, they'll, if the Lord continues to tarry, then uh, we're going to find ourselves you, um, with lots of African missionaries helping us out. Right. So one of the responsibilities of CMJ is we have to is is the role of education. That's one of our aims, and uh, we we need to make sure that we. Um, we don't forget uh, um, to, to help Africa and uh, and the, the growing movements in Asia with their Jewish roots, because um, uh, where are they going to learn it? So one of our missions. Alrighty, okay, guys. Well. I'll stop the recording here. Here's my stop recording. <laughs>